right. Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Scott Dixon, head guide for Trout's Fly Fishing here in Denver, Colorado. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about fly fishing along the South Platte River. Um, I've been fishing the South Platte for quite a few years. I think I first started fishing down there probably in 95, and the first handful of years that I was down there fishing, I had no idea what I was doing. I was using great big flies and thinking big fish eat big flies. And I learned kind of quickly that that's not the case. Um, the South Platte River, it's only about an hour away from Denver, and it gets a fair amount of pressure, and those fish get educated. Uh, there's smart fish up there. Uh, the first handful of years, every now and then, I'd be pretty excited to catch one or two. Um, but then I had one of those days up there where I kind of feel like I put everything together and and started catching fish and started hoping to, instead of hoping to catch fish, I started kind of expecting to. But still, 20 years later, after that day up on the plat, um, I still find that I have a, a bit to learn about fishing up there where it's not always easy. There's some days that are definitely better than others, um, but some days it's still pretty tough up there. Uh, smart fish and it, uh, it makes it, makes it a challenge and it keeps me going back time after time after time just because of the challenge that it's there. Uh, another reason why I spend a lot of time up there is just the convenience of it. Being an hour from town, I can get up there, get fishing. Uh, a lot of times I'll drop the boys off at school, head up, fish for a little bit, and then be able to be back in time to pick them up from school. So uh, the South Platte, the part that I am mainly fishing and talking about today is kind of what we call the Deckers area. It is from Cheeseman Reservoir pretty much down to the confluence with the North Fork of the South Platte. Uh, there's about 14 miles or just over 14 miles of public water along that stretch up there. And it's all great uh, water. It's all very fishy. Um, the upper part of it, uh, in and around Deckers, it probably sees the most pressure. Um, but uh, like I said, there's 14 miles of public water up there where I know a lot of people will get up there and uh, see the crowds and almost want to turn around and go home. And I always tell people, uh, don't go home, just go downstream. Check out some all water that you haven't explored yet, that you haven't fished, because um, there's fish all up and down that river. Uh, when we're fishing up there, the main fish that we're targeting, uh, for the most part, is rainbows and brown trout. Um, and they vary in size where you get some 12 inches all the way up to some 22, 24 inches. You don't find as many of those big, big fish, uh, but each year it seems like I find one or two real good quality size fish. Um, they're big for a reason. They're smart. And tricking those guys to eat a fly is, is, can be a, a challenge. Um, but like I said, it's, it's one of my spots that I've probably fish the most out of uh, the waters in the Colorado, and it's still one of my favorites. Um, when I go up there and guide, uh, because of the permitting rules on where we're allowed to fish, there's a certain section that we guide a little bit downstream from the coast. But as a general public, you can fish it from top to bottom, from the going in from either the top or the bottom, into Cheeseman Canyon, all the way down to the confluence with the North Fork of the South Platte. Um, you get some really good quality hatches, um, along with lots of fish that like to eat. So when I'm up there guiding, I generally guide in uh, uh, a handful of specific areas where our permits allow us. Uh, but when I have a chance to get up and fish on my own, I try to go and fish new spots and different pieces of water. and. Um, even though I've been fishing up there a long time, there's still many days where I'll be driving downstream and I'll see a piece of water and be like, oh, you know what? I don't know if I've fished that one or not. And it's always fun getting out, seeing what's around out there and checking out and exploring some new stuff. Um, but uh, enough about me and the river. Now we're going to start talking about a little bit of the different stuff. Um, we'll be discussing the type of river that it is. Um, like I said, with it being, uh, it's a tailwater. So the water from the Middle Fork of the South Platte is coming out from below Cheeseman Reservoir. And that makes it nice because throughout the course of the year, uh, during the wintertime, 
uh, it keeps it from icing over. There's days where it's real cold and you'll have some shelf ice. And I've even been up there on cold, cold days where there's been some anchor ice on the bottom. Um, but as you're closer to the dam, that water will stay open uh, pretty much all throughout the year. The further you get downstream away from the dam, uh, the water gets a little bit colder during those winter months and you will find some more ice. Uh, a lot of times driving up there during the winter time, it almost looks like it's a slushy out there with just so much ice and stuff built up upon it. Um, but as you work your way upstream and get closer to deckers in the dam, you'll find that the water opens back up. Uh, during the summertime, kind of the opposite happens. The water coming out of the reservoir is usually fairly cold, but as you go further downstream, especially during the hot months of the, the summer, July and August, uh, especially if we have low flows, you really got to be careful when fishing because that lower section of water will also get warmer. And we've had times over the last few years where those lower flows and the water downstream has got into the mid 60s to 70 degrees. And at that point, uh, you really need to stop fishing. Um, you don't want to try to catch a fish in that warm water and then not be able to revive them. Um, so throughout the course of the year, uh, depending upon flows and water temperatures, you kind of got to pay attention to, to those things where downstream you may have a lot of ice or you might have too hot of water to, to fish in. Um, but like I said, being a tailwater, that's not something that happens each year. For the most part, we're going to be able to have some good cold water coming out of the dam and makes for excellent fishing uh, pretty much year round up there. Um, here in Colorado, where I know some plates, places have specific uh, trout opening days, here in Colorado along the South Platte, you can fish it every day throughout the year. Um, there might be some days where it's so cold that you won't see anybody else up there. And uh, I used to be one of those guys that got up there and didn't matter what the temperature was, I was going to be out fishing. Um, but nowadays, it got a little softer and those cold, cold days just aren't quite as enjoyable. So. I'm lucky enough to be able to pick and choose some of the days that I go up and fish it. So uh, a lot of those bitter cold days I'll skip nowadays. So um, the river has a really nice uh, bottom to it. Uh, it has kind of uh, crushed granite, a uh, little bit of cobble, but it makes for wading around the river pretty easily. Um, a lot of rivers around the state are going to be real slick and it's like walking on grease bowling balls. Up on the Platte, it's a very wading friendly river. Um, you're able to get uh, across it fairly easily most of the year. Once the flows get above 500 CFS, it makes it really tricky to cross. And because it's controlled by the dam, a lot of times during the summer months, we'll have a spike in flows and it'll get up above 500 where you're pretty much uh, forced to fish just from one side of the river. There are specific areas where you may be able to get across, but in those high flows, you you just got to watch yourself because even though it is a good bottom for walking around, um, making it easy to travel, with that water pushing on you, you still to watch yourself. Um, you're kind of fishing from top to bottom in somewhat of a canyon down through there. Um, and the banks are kind of high cut banks and areas. Some other parts are kind of uh, shallow areas that uh, kind of lead out towards the center of the river. But along all the banks, you'll find a lot of willows. And the willows are great for getting up, up out of the banks because they're easy to grab hold of and pull yourself up. But they also tend to catch a lot of uh, flies in line while you're casting. So when you're out in the river fishing, you always got to be mindful of the, the bank and where you're at and to position with it. Um, and it uh, it works out pretty well. There's a few sections of private water that are tucked in the, the plat between Cheeseman and the confluence, but there's only a few of them. Uh, right below Cheeseman Reservoir is the, an area called the Wigwam Club uh, where it is closed to public access. And then a few miles downstream from Deckers, there's another little area called Swayback Ranch. But for the most part, you have 14 miles of public access. Um, if you're not seeing uh, signs that say it's private, uh, for the most part, when you're up there, 
you have uh, access to cover all the river that you want. Um, it makes it real nice because on busy days, if uh, you're not finding the exact spot you want to go to, it's easy to just uh, move on either upstream or downstream more till you find that open water and that solitude you're looking for. Um, solitude can be a issue up there um, where there's days on the river where you'll be by yourself, but there will be other days where when you look upstream or downstream, you might see a few other people out on the water. Uh, Decker's area gets a, a bad rap for being a very crowded area, uh, and it can be crowded. But at the same time, there's plenty of water up there where you can go and get away from people and still fish. It might not be your, your first choice, or you might be having to explore some brand new water, but that's part of the fun of it. Um, I like the solitude, and I would rather fish further downstream, fish new stuff that I either have been to before or haven't been to um, and go out there and see what fish are in and around that area. I have my spots where I know there's always fish, but at the same time, I'm not the only one that knows those spots. So sometimes I'll have a game plan set up in my head when I go up there on a guide trip and I'll get to the river and I'll see somebody already fishing areas that I would like to hit and you just have to be flexible and go where people aren't. And like I said, uh, there's there's fish all around up there, so you can always find spots to, to fish them. But I do know that the lower part of the river is uh, a lot less crowded than the upper part. And uh, getting out and exploring down there can really pay dividends because you can still find some really nice fish down through there. Um, currently on the river, the flows are about 257 CFS, and that's a great spring flow. Fish have plenty of uh, room to move around, um, but entering these uh, soon to be May and June, we're going to start experiencing some more snow melt and they'll probably start raising the flows up a little bit. Um, even in the higher flows, those fish still will uh, still like to eat. They just change where they hang out. And a lot of it during the time when the flows start bumping up. It's just branching out, seeing where the fish are, trying to find them, and then uh, changing your tactics on, on how to catch those guys. There are certain areas where in the higher flows you really can't even jump in the water, where you're pretty much forced to fish from the bank. And being up on that higher bank is not a bad thing because you have a little bit better vantage point to see where the fish are sitting, and then you can target them uh, that way. Um, but it's, it's a nice little area up there. Um, it, uh, it gets a lot of different users. Um, for the most part, when I'm up there, even though it's the, from, I guess, uh, downstream of Deckers all the way down, it's not necessarily considered catch and release water where people are allowed to keep fish. I never see anybody keeping fish up there. The people that go up there, uh, are generally up there recreating. And, uh, I don't think last year I saw one fish. Uh, when I was up there on the water, actually pulled out and kept, which is a nice thing to, to see. Um, during the summertime, uh, another uh, section of the segment that is enjoying the river up there are the tubers. Uh, we call it the 12 hatch because uh, during those hot months during the summer, you'll encounter tubers. And uh, I know some people poo poo on the, the tubers as they go by, but um, I've watched tubers go right in front of me and pass and say hello, get right back to fishing. And those fish don't care. They may move for a minute, but they move right back over into their holding spots and you can uh, just keep on fishing and it doesn't really push the fish down like it does in other areas on other waters. Um, those fish are used to seeing people up there and they do spook and will move away, but give them a minute, they'll be right back over into their feeding lanes. And it's a, it's a great thing where um, when I first encountered my first set of tubers, I was like, oh man, these guys are just going to ruin my, my whole spot and sat there and made a few casts after they went by and boom, right into a fish. So I learned right away that, uh, seeing the, the tubers and the other recreators up on the water isn't going to be a bad thing. It's uh, going to allow you to take a break for a second while they go by, but right, uh, but right back to fishing as soon as they're gone. So it works out pretty well up there. Um, another thing to watch for, especially this time of year, 
and in the fall that I always like to talk about is the spawning fish. Uh, there's a healthy population of naturally reproducing fish up on the river. Um, but to ensure that their populations are going to remain there for years to come is to fish it ethically during the spawning season. Uh, if you see spawning beds on the river, make sure you give them a wide berth and not walk over them. And definitely if you see fish up on spawning beds, don't try to fish for those fish. Um, during the fall, you have the browns that spawn and during the spring, you have the rainbows. Um, and generally during those times, uh, walking around either sight fishing or fishing some of the deeper runs, uh, you can definitely see the ones that are paired up and actively spawning. And those are the ones that you want to stay away from. Uh, you don't want to be out there trying to catch those fish while trying to uh, reproduce and be the, the future of, of the, the South Platte up there. Um, we want those fish to be healthy uh, and populate and continue being a great fishery for years and years to come. So uh, that's my two cents on it. Um, let's see. I think I have a question coming up. Question. Question for you, Scott. Somewhat unrelated, but um, Let's Go is asking, why did you choose fly fishing out of all the kinds of fishing that are available? Um, well, I grew up spin fishing and trolling. So I grew up on the Puget Sound out in uh, the Seattle area and growing up that's all I did. But once I kind of moved out to Colorado, I got a little bit of a taste to it. Went over to uh, Washington State University and had a few good for, good childhood friends that I've known forever that uh, kind of got me more into fly fishing. And once I caught a fish on a fly rod, uh, that was it. I, I was, I guess you could say I was hooked. Um, you're constantly casting, you're constantly uh, working, moving, uh, changing rigs. Uh, I really like the challenge of it. I like the way the fish fought on the, the fly rod more than I would on a, a spin rod or casting bait out there or just trolling around waiting for something to bite. Um, I like the action of the fly fishing. Um, it's something that I like I was saying, I've been doing for quite a while now, but it's I'm not perfect at it. And I'm still learning new things all the time, uh, still learning new tricks. Uh, yeah, with fly fishing, you're never done learning. You're never perfect at it. You're, uh, you're going to have some days where you go out there and do great. You're going to have other days where you can go out there and struggle. Um, and I've kind of learned to accept it where uh, days where I go out there and struggle, it kind of humbles me and keeps me in uh, keeps me in my place and reminds me that I still have a, a lot to learn. But I think it's the, the fight and the action of fly fishing that made me kind of put down the spin rods and stick mainly just with the, the fly rods. And, and I'll still use a spin rod from time to time. Um, when I'm down in Florida, I love hucking uh, the cuda rigs um, for the barracuda where – hucking those as far as I can up into the mangroves and ripping them back to the boat. Um, I have a lot of fun doing that. Uh, so it's not, it's not the only type of fishing I do, but it's my, my preferred fishing method. So kite fishing is another thing that I love down in South Florida and the kite out with the live bait back behind there. And I thought it was going to be a little bit like trolling, um, where you're just kind of sitting there waiting, but you're very engaged with what's going on and you never know what you're going to catch in the ocean. And that's one of my favorite things about fishing out in the ocean where you get sailfish, you get tuna, mahi-mahi, um, sharks, uh, barracuda, you name it. You can catch them out in the, the blue water. And so it's, uh, it's fun stuff. So, um, but uh, now I'm going to go on and I'm going to start discussing uh, some of the gear that uh, we use up on the South Platte. Um, generally up there, a four or five weight rod is the, the way to go. And I prefer having a, my preference is a nine foot. I like a nine foot five weight. That's kind of my uh, go-to all around rod. Um, it works out great where I can turn over some heavy nymph rigs. I can throw dry flies out there. During the winter months when the flows are a little bit lower, um, I love fishing four weights. Uh, they have a little bit softer tip. Uh, you can still nymph with it, still throw those dry flies, throw those small midges. 
Um, this time of year, I've been using the four weight quite a bit where we've been having some great beta hatches lately and it's a kick to be out there uh, throwing dry flies on the river. Um, quite a bit of what I do on a daily basis is I nymph and wait for a hatch to happen. Uh, once the hatch happens and fish start rising, then I switch over to the dry fly rig and, and start trying to get them to look up and come take the dry flies. Um, people ask me quite a bit about uh, rods and which rod they need to get. And my personal preference is I'm a Winston guy. I think they make uh, fantastic rods. I like fishing that or those rods. Um, but in general, if you have a rod and it gets you out on the water, that's where you want to be. Um, you don't uh, necessarily have to have the newest and greatest rod to be out on the water. Um, as long as you have a rod that's going to get you out there and allow you to catch fish, uh, go out there and fish it. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, the, the lines that I use, I just use floating lines up there. <coughs> excuse me for one second. Um, for the most part, I, like I was saying, I <coughs> strictly use floating lines. I do have a, a six weight that I'll bring up there from time to time, uh, throw streamers that has a sink tip. But if I'm going to be up there day in, day out, uh, a weight forward, four or five floating lines is going to be the, the way to go. Um, it's very, it's versatile enough that I can do anything I want with it, where I can throw streamers, I can throw drives, I can throw uh, nymph rigs, um, pretty much whatever I want to be fishing out there, I, I can be with the uh, um, a weight forward floating line. Um, the leaders and tippets that I use, that kind of changes as the year goes on. Um, during the winter months and actually even during the, the summer months, depending upon flows. Um, if it's not uh, super big flows where I don't have to get down real, real deep, um, generally what I'll use is a, a seven and a half foot 3X leader. Um, and on the end of that, I'll usually add some 5X tippet to it. Uh, during the winter months where the fish are not quite as active, um, and aren't moving around, there's not as much food there, I tend to go from a, um, a 7.5 foot 3x leader down to 5x to my lead fly and then back behind there I'll run 6x to my my droppers. And a lot of times I'm using a 2 fly rig, a lot of times I'm using a 3 fly rig. Um, when the flows come up and there's more volume in the water, I end up going to a 9 foot 3x leader and again, I'm pretty much always putting a little bit of uh, fluorocarbon tippet off the back end of it. Um, I figure up there with educated fish, any advantage you can get is going to be worth the, worth the time to do. And I find going with that fluorocarbon tippet, um, it's nice and strong and it's a little bit less visible to the fish. Uh, the fish we find up along the South Platte are fairly leader shy. Um, they'll get up there and if you're throwing uh, too thick of tippet, or uh, they might take a look at it, but chances are they won't eat it. Um, higher flows, it makes it nice because you can get rid of that 5x tippet and you can start running 3x pretty much the whole way down your rig. And in the bigger water, uh, the fish aren't quite as uh, selective, aren't quite as spooky. Um, where you can get away with doing it. But a lot of the times a year during the lower flows, uh, that 5X tippet is, I use that uh, going down to my lead fly and then down to my droppers. Um, going back to gear to use, uh, through most of the year, I'll wear uh, full chest waders and, and wading boots. Uh, during the summer months, that gets warm up there and there'll be times where I'll wet wade, where I'll just wear the guard socks and my wading shoes. Um, but that uh, kind of depends. Uh, a lot of times I'll get up there during the summer and it'll be a hot morning. I'll have my waders on. When I take a break, eat lunch, I'll lose the waders and I'll go into the just kind of wet wading. Um, I know some people that wet wade uh, quite a bit up there. And again, 
a little bit softer than some of those guys where I don't like being cold. So I'll wear those those chest waders until it gets to the point where it's just too warm and too uncomfortable to wear. And then I'll uh, wet wade and, and get out there. Um, it, it's pretty nice uh, to go out, fish up there in shorts, short, short sleeve shirt um, during those warm summer months. Um, and another thing that I really like about the South Platte compared to a lot of the other rivers around the state is I don't find nearly as many mosquitoes up there as I do on like the Colorado River or the Williams Fork where you try to wet weight up there and you just get eaten alive sometimes and that's no fun. Uh, I'd rather be hot and wear my waders and my long sleeve shirts and get chewed on by mosquitoes all day but up along the Platte not as big a deal. We do get some up there for sure, but it's just you don't find the swarms of them as you do in other places. So um, going with the, the waders, um, again, similar to the rods, any waders that get you up on the water is going to be perfect waders to use. Um, I'm out on the water uh, quite a bit each year, um, and I always like stuff that's going to last and hold up and I'll be able to beat up and use for work and still last. And so uh, because of that fact, I always use uh, Sims fishing products. Uh, Sims makes durable waders, great boots. Uh, they make stuff for fishermen and they make it to last and take the abuse and uh, still keep you uh, warm and dry all throughout the year. So um, my two, uh, two recommendations that I uh, give people that are gonna go out and get stuff, Get stuff that's going to be comfortable, function, and is going to be built to last. And I know Sims products are ones that do that. So um, now I'm going to start talking about some. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and start talking about sight fishing up on the plat. Uh, throughout the year, one of the main things that I do when I go up there is I sight fish. And since it is a tailwater, that water is coming out crystal clear all throughout the year. There's days where we might get some heavy rain and we'll have some runoff issues where uh, the water will get uh, kind of dirty and off color, uh, makes it a little bit harder to find the fish. Um, but generally, uh, we're going to be fishing in sunshine in clear water. So it makes sight fishing a lot of fun and very easy. Um, I love throwing dry flies because I love watching them eat, but probably my next favorite thing since we don't have dry fly hatches where they're consistently coming up day in, day out, all throughout the year, we do a lot of nymphing. And being able to sight fish, uh, being able to spot the fish, uh, present your flies in front of them, and watch them turn on it and eat is pretty much just as fun as throwing a dry fly, in my opinion. I love seeing the fish eat, seeing them chase streamers, seeing them come up and sip bugs. Um, working with nymphs and sight fishing up there can be just as enjoyable. Um, I was talking about a lot of the cut banks up there earlier, and a lot of times as I'm walking around the river, uh, I'll be up on the bank rather than in the water. It just gives me a little bit of a higher perspective to look down in the water and see the fish. Um, once I find them, I'll try to keep my eyes on them without spooking them, and I mean, if I find a fish, that's the one I'm going to target. Um, there's fish all up and down that river, and there's times where I'll have a fish in mind I'll see and I'll work it and change flies and work it some more and still uh, be able to get them to eat. Um, I've gotten to the point with a lot of those fish, I will give it my best effort and if I'm not getting them, I'm going to move on and find another fish because I know there's lots of fish up there. Um, some of the fish, if I walk around a bin and I see one um, and start fishing for them and can't get them to eat, I don't know what that fish's history was. There could have been somebody up on the bank or up around the bend right before I got there who had caught that fish and released it, and so it's just kind of chilling down in that area. Um, if I give it my best effort and can't get them to eat, a lot of times I'll go find another one. I do get stubborn and will pursue the same fish over and over, especially if it's one that's a good size. Uh, I'll change my rig up, uh, pretty much change everything to try to get them to eat. and. Uh, sometimes I just got to put my tail between my legs and ride it off as, uh, okay, couldn't catch that one today. Uh, go find another one that I can. So I like feeling the, the tug of a fish at the end of the rod. And if there's one that I've worked for and can't get, 
um, sometimes that fish just has got the better of me and uh, I'll move on to find one that I can get. But um, all throughout the river, um, you'll be able to, to find fish up there. Even in the deeper holes, uh, a lot of times you can't see all the way down to the bottom, but you'll be able to see fish suspended, flashes of, of the fish that uh, give themselves away. Um, and those are the ones that I'm going to try to look for. Um, as I cruise around uh, the river, and when I'm up there, whether, whether I'm guiding or fishing, I move quite a bit throughout the day. I'm not going to be one of the guys that sits in a hole for half a day trying to get every fish in there. Uh, cause like I said, there's plenty of fish in that river. So I'm going to work an area, then I'm going to go find some other fish to try to work for. Uh, then I'll go find some more and just kind of move around, look for fish, and try to target those ones. Um, a lot of times you'll be able to see them in the shallows, and in the shallows, uh, they're great to, to try to target, um, but they can be kind of spooky. So your presentation has to be right. Um, and it's something I'll get into a little bit more later, but uh, switching that rig up. Uh, a lot of times you may have a little bit too much weight on it. Uh, you're getting down too deep. Sometimes you're not getting down deep enough to the fish. Um, so being able to kind of see where they are, see how they're feeding, um, that can help you make the necessary changes to, to go get the fish that uh, you're seeing and are trying to, to target. Um, when I'm out on the river looking for fish, some just pop out uh, plain as day, where other ones are a little bit more hidden, especially if there's some depth involved in, in the river. And as I'm staring into the river, I'm going to look for clues. Um, being up there uh, for quite a few years, I find that I am better at sight fishing up on the plat than a lot of the other rivers I go to, just because I'm used to looking for specific things on the water and different shapes. Every now and then you might see a little flash of a pectoral fin. Sometimes you might see the white of their mouth open and close. You might see a, a tail wag back behind a fish. Um, when you see those clues, just focus in on that spot. Um, a lot of times people walk right by fish um, and they think they might see something but wasn't the, exactly the fish shape that they were looking for, so they'll pass it. Um, what I usually will do if I see something that looks kind of fishy, I'll just take my time and stare at it. And every now and then you look at it long enough, it's going to give you more and more clues to, yep, that for sure is a fish. Um, and those are the ones, when you find them, uh, that's the one you want to target. Um, those are uh, kind of harder to do without polarized glasses. And so when people are fishing, I always recommend wearing glasses uh, just for eye protection and then polarized glasses to help you find the fish. But then on top of that, getting good polarized glasses. Um, they make a huge difference out on the water. Um, having a gas station pair of polarized glasses will help out. It'll break up some of the glare. But when you're out there specifically hunting and targeting fish, uh, having a good pair of polarized glasses is sometimes one of the most important pieces of equipment uh, you'll have during the day. Um, they will allow those fish to, to show up a little bit more. And, and a lot of times, especially... Um, when I'm talking with clients and stuff, I'm like, I'm not seeing it. And to me, it's as clear as day. Um, the lenses and uh, uh, part of it is too, again, going back to me spending so much time up on the water. Uh, a lot of times when I'm looking at the water, the fish just kind of pop out and I can, I can spot them. Um, can't see everyone. I'm sure I walk past plenty of fish that um, are right there in front of me that I uh, either missed or didn't quite see. But uh but uh, I have fairly good fish eyes, and that, that really helps me out in guiding and fishing up on the water. Um, let's see. Uh, when I'm looking in there, oh, uh, before I keep on going, I'm going to answer a question real quick. Yep. We have a couple questions, Scott. Um, what is the fish count per mile uh, up at Deckers? And um, why did you become a guide? And then someone wants to know your favorite color and favorite scent. I think that's a joke. Um, and then we'll get to a couple other questions after you answer those two. So, you know, I used to know the fish count up on the, the plat. Um, 
and if I throw out a number, I don't think it'll be right because it's it's been a while since I've heard what the statistics are up there. Um, I know there's a lot of fish, and I know it's a good fishery with a good population of fish. Um, it's still considered uh, gold medal water, um, but I forget what the qualifications to make that actually are. Um, so I'm sorry I can't answer that one. Oh, uh, go uh, ahead. A quick a quick search with. Uh the CPW, it looks like it's 3,000 per mile. 3,000 per mile. Lots of fish up there. So thank you for that. Um, yeah, I think I have mentioned it more than once, but there's a lot of fish in the South Platte River. So top to bottom, there's a good quality fish, and, and it's a, a great place to go if you want to try to get some. Tough place to go where you got to kind of pay your dues up there, um, really figure out how to, to fish it. Um, but that's something where a lot of times I like uh, giving myself a little plug and saying, hire a guide. Your learning curve up there is uh, can be a lot steeper uh, going out with a guide who knows the water, who works that area quite a bit. Um, I've, uh, I've paid my dues and spent a lot of days up there trying to figure it out, still kind of in the process of figuring it out after 20 plus years, but um, getting better and better at it all the time. Um, and uh, real quick, Yvonne, there, besides the fish count up on the uh, South Platte, what was the second part of the question? Oh, uh, I remember. Why did I become a guide? Why did you become a guide? Uh, and then uh, how do you like to guide on the Platte? Um, so I took a – I had a job out of college that I wasn't a huge fan of and working at a fishing shop as, in a, as a kid and – I've always kind of fished. I thought it would be a fun summer job to work at a shop and start guiding. Um, I didn't really have a career plan that that was going to be uh, my profession, but now 20 years later, it's my profession. Um, I love guiding. I love being out on the water. I love uh, sharing the experience with people, uh, helping create memories, helping people improve, become better fishers um, or better anglers. Um, I enjoy what I do and I feel very fortunate to, to be a, a guide and be in the position that I am to do something that I love to do and, and share that with other people. Um, the guiding the plat, uh, it can be difficult. Uh, I'm not going to lie. There's days during the summer where there's quite a few people up there and it's public water. So there's a lot of people out there. And it's not uh, so busy where it's one person stacked upon another person stacked upon another person. Um, but a lot of the uh, good quality runs are going to have people in it. And being a person that likes to move around when I fish, um, a lot of times during the, the summer months when it does get busy, and it's, it's uh, I don't want to scare people away by saying that it's super busy and there's only so many people up there you can't find a spot to fish. That's not the case. There's plenty of fish up there and there's plenty of water. Um, but sometimes uh, the some of the runs that I love fishing, they're already going to be occupied. And by being up there a lot and knowing the river, I just move on till I find another spot that's open water. And, and with 3,000 fish per mile, you're going to find some other fish. Um, it uh, I know some people give uh, Deckers a bad rap and – and think it would be horrible to guide upon, but it's uh, it is a good quality of the river there, and uh, it's close to home. I would love to um, be somewhere like Basalt, where I could go out my back door and be fishing either the Roaring Fork or the Frying Pan. But I live down in the Front Range, and uh, doing a uh, from my house up to the river about 50 55 minute drive to get up there. Um, I don't encounter traffic. Um, I have friends that work in the city that are uh, doing the same length commute or shorter commute, but in the car the same amount of time just because of traffic. I'm on a dirt road part of the time and going up through the mountains, and I don't mind the drive one bit. Um, and I don't mind uh, when I get up there and, and I see a bunch of cars. I don't let it frighten me. I don't let it uh, necessarily make it change my plan. I'm still going to take my clients out, still going to put them on fish and try to show them the best day I can. Um, and yeah, and that's my, that's my goal day in, day out throughout the year. And 
the uh, the South Platte is not the only water that we guide on or I guide on. Uh, we also have permits for uh, the Blue, the Williams Fork, the Colorado, the Eagle, the Dream Stream, plus uh, quite a few private water options. So, um, but I do have to say I probably spend at least half my season uh, up at Decker's guiding. Um, so I'll be up there probably 100 days a year. Um, and then uh, the other half of my season kind of split between other spots uh, in and around the state. So um, it's a it's a good quality fishery. And uh, a lot of uh, every now and then you'll run into people up there that don't have the best angling etiquette. Uh, either they're jerks or they just don't know any better. But for the most part, on day in, day out, being up on the water, what I encounter is people with fairly good river etiquette. And, uh, and then some of the times that you don't, it's it's one of those things where sometimes people just don't know any better and instead of letting it piss me off or get me all mad about something or other i'll just keep on moving on over to my my next spot and keep on doing my thing because i can't control what everybody else is doing but i can control what i'm doing and what i'm doing for my clients so to me that's the most important thing so um all right now i'm gonna continue on to the next little part and I'm going to talk about uh, rigging. Um, like I said earlier, generally uh, seven and a half foot three x leader, five x tippet off the back end of it, um, and that goes to my lead fly. Um, my lead fly, uh, I add that section of fluorocarbon tippet to the end of my leader uh, for two reasons: to make my leader a little bit longer and to get down to using the fluorocarbon. But also, I find it a very effective way to keep my weight in place. Um, a lot of what I'm doing up there is, like I said, nymph fishing. Um, and a lot of times, if I don't have my uh, weight uh, above my knot, sometimes after uh, casting around a little bit, I'll find that weight slides all the way down and is resting right at top, right on top of my lead fly. And that just doesn't like or doesn't work out quite as well. Um, throughout the course of the year. I use probably, uh, the, well, there's certain months where I go with kind of more of a techie nymph rig where I just have small little nymphs on there. But for the most part, throughout the season, I'm throwing maybe four or five lead flies. And they are as follows. Egg patterns during the fall and spring. Uh, fish love eating eggs. Also, another thing they love eating year-round are worms. Uh, quite a bit throughout the year, I'll use a San Juan worm as my lead fly. Um, stone flies, we got quite a few stone flies up on the South Platte, I'll use that. And then either leeches or egg sucking leeches. Um, and those all can be very effective. There's times where I'll get more fish just on my lead fly than I will on any of my trailers. Um, but the lead flies, um, they, they work out good. A lot of times if a fish doesn't eat your lead fly, it's an attention getter and the fish will look over, notice it, may not go exactly for the worm or the leech that you have going down, but while it's looking in that direction, it might see a little nymph behind it and come over and eat that. Um, the worms up on the South Platte being kind of a, that crushed granite bottom, there's a ton of worms up there. And uh, when you notice that there's fish on worms, it is kind of ridiculous, where I've uh, put a few fish in my net that I've caught uh, on a worm, and as I've been removing the, the hook, um, it is literally throwing up worms, where it's just eating so many, it just can't keep them all down. I've had the same thing happen with uh, leeches up there, I've had the same thing happen with scuds. Um, when they're on them, they're on them. Um, and a lot of times, it uh, you'll see worms getting washed down when the flows bump up, um, and be willing to sit there and switch up your worm color because they they do get fairly specific on their well, which ones they want to eat and especially when the flows bump up and there's a lot of worms in the water they're looking for the natural ones um, kind of my standard is a worm brown but throughout the course of the year I'll use red I'll use pink I'll use kind of a wine or a purple uh, worm um, and I've even got to the point where I've started kind of dyeing some of my own chenille uh, to give it that kind of purpley, brownish, pinkish uh, that looks a little bit more real. Uh, looks like the, the worms that the fish kind of puke up. 
Um, so I've started playing around a little bit more with that to get that right color because you, uh, a lot of times when they're on the worms, they're on them, but when they start getting selective about it, they want one that's more of that natural worm color. Um, with the leeches, uh, a lot of times it is, well, it's coming up right around the corner. Usually it's May and June is my leech season where I notice a lot of leeches are, are in the water and they're never the type that are in the water where I worry about what waiting, like one's going to try to stick to my leg. They're kind of getting washed off some of the rocks and the fish are just uh, chowing on them as they're coming down. Um, starting in May, I use a lot of egg sucking leeches as well. Um, with those rainbows starting to spawn in the spring, uh, those leeches will find those eggs and get kind of washed down and uh, it's uh, the two for one. You get the egg and the leech that helps get the fish's attention. Um, between my lead fly and where I put my weight, um, I kind of started right at that uh, probably 12, sometimes 14 inch range, but I don't have it separated too far. If I have that weight too far above my uh, my flies, my weight's getting down, but my flies are not. Uh, they're going to be kind of um, floating up higher in the water column. And a big part of when you're nymph fishing up there is getting it to the right depth. Um, so when I rig, I will uh, add split shot to it to get it down. Um, if I'm nymphing, my general rule of thumb, if I'm not ticking bottom about every six drifts, I'm not getting down deep enough. Uh, I'll add a little bit of weight um, or I'll adjust my indicator to, to get it down a little bit more. Um, those fine tuning adjustments can really be a game changer up there as far as uh, getting into the fish. Um, if you're not getting down to them, you're going right over the top of them sometimes. Uh, if the fish are suspended, kind of eating emergers and stuff, and you have a ton of weight on still, you're going right below the fish and aren't getting a chance to get to the fish that are actively feeding. Um, I switch out my weights quite a bit from hole to hole. Uh, each spot I get to, I'm going to need to make a weight adjustment. Um, and I'll uh, make those little fine adjustments and then go with that. Uh, when I'm throwing stoneflies, uh, a lot of times I'll use a weighted stone and I won't need nearly as much weight as I would earlier. Um, the, the key is just to be able to get it down to their feeding lanes. And when you find the, the fish and see where they're feeding, if you're getting down below them, you're going too deep. If you're not getting quite down deep enough to them, then uh, yeah, you're going right over their heads. And a lot of times they're not uh, looking up to come come get those things. Um, so I have my lead fly, I have my, my weight go down to my lead fly. Uh, then off my lead fly, I'll put on some different nymphs. Um, a lot of it during the winter, I'm going with small little uh, midges, um, usually 22s, 24s. I personally don't get down to size 26. Um, and I know that the fish definitely eat them up there. I just have such a hard time tying them on right now. Um, it is a, it's kind of a, a struggle at times. And so I end up not uh, going down to the, the 26s. But I do fish quite a few 24s, especially during the winter months when the, there's not quite as much food out there. Um, uh, you have midges year round up on the plat. And so it's a main part of the, the fish's diet. Um, so going with the, the tiny midges, I always say, like, give them what they want. And if they're eating tiny little midges, give them tiny little midges to eat. Um, I like the uh, Black Beauties, Miracles, uh, the Demon Midge, uh, little Floss Midges, Pure Midges, um, any little thing like that. And a lot of times when I'm fishing during the winter months, switch up that color keep them small but just kind of uh, switch it up uh, top secret medallion midges those are two others of, that i really like uh, little juju midges are great um, but this time of year uh, up there uh, i'm going to start my mornings with my lead fly and then go to uh, a midge and a lot of times i'll run a three fly midge where i just tie the tippet on the back bend of the hook and i'll have three flies uh, floating down the river uh, together call my floating buffet line, um, but it, uh, it ends up working out very well. 
uh, in the mornings, I'll be fishing for the midges. But as that day goes on, uh, especially, and I'm talking about this time of year right now, um, I'm going to start right around 11, 12 o'clock putting on a blueing olive uh, emerger or nymph. Um, going with the Juju Betis, RS2s, pheasant tails, um, some specific ones that I tie up. Um, those are those are kind of my go-to. Um, once I have started doing that and notice they're keen in on it, I'm going to get rid of that uh, that midge that I have on there, and I'm going to go a lead fly with two betas. And again, it's giving them what they want. Um, we're getting to the point right now as well, coming up on May, that we're going to start seeing more and more caddis on the water. Um, so fishing buckskins, uh, fishing little uh, holy grails. Um, different little caddis flies are a, a great thing as well. Um, if I'm fishing in the shallow water uh, and I'm still working the nymphs, haven't really got over to talk about dry fly fishing yet, um, but when I'm nymph fishing, um, a lot of times I'll use bead headed flies and get rid of the split shot altogether, um, especially if I'm fishing shallow stuff. Um, that works out uh, very well as far as not hanging up on the bottom each time but still having enough weight on there to get your flies to sink and get down to where the fish are feeding um and uh the my flies that i use like i said i end up using a sliding perfection loop to tie my fluorocarbon tippet on the back bend of the hooks um and when it's still kind of low flows and those fish are still a little bit spooky um, at the beginning of, I guess it would be late winter, beginning of spring, I'll still be using some 6X at times. Um, but as the flows start coming up and I see the fish are a little bit more active and have more or different food sources, um, then I'm going to go ahead and go with 5X. And once those flows come up even more and I find that I can get away with it, I'll go ahead and uh, use 4X to my lead fly. So go ahead. Uh, question. Uh, Scott Larson's asking any particular pattern of leech. Um, you know, uh, mares, uh, micro leech works real well. Um, Matt McCannell has a, a killer leech as well. I forget what exactly his is called, um, but those are good leech patterns. Um, I have one that I use with the kind of dark olive pine squirrel. And I find it to be very effective. Um, the leeches that you find up there are, they're not super big leeches. Um, so about an inch long. Sometimes I'll fish them, especially in heavier water, a little bit bigger. Um, but uh, some of those tiny leeches work real well. But uh, Mara and uh, McCannell's uh, leeches both are, are good ones that I'd recommend that do the job up there. So drop something. Um, but those, yeah, those are, those would be the two different leech patterns that I'd recommend. Um, and, uh, I don't, I, uh, since the majority of the flies I use are ones that I tie, um, I'm not up to date on all the different killer leech patterns out there, but I'm, I'm sure there's several, but those two that I named are, are both real good ones. So, um, let's see. Um, and I'm going to back up just a little bit because it's something I kind of, uh, hit on, but I want to get into a little bit more specific. Um, so we're, we're feeding the fish, um, with what we see out there. And like I said, the mornings are usually mid times. Um, if I have an egg on and I'm some of the stonefly husks that are floating by, I may switch off an egg and go to a, a stonefly. Um, when they start molting, a lot of times they're getting washed down the river and, and fish are keen in on those. Um, Pat's rubber legs is a, a great stonefly imitation that I use quite a bit up there. Um, but it goes, uh, what I'm going to go back to is kind of looking at the river and taking clues from what the river is clues that the river is giving you. So like I said, when you're up there in the morning, you see a lot of midges flying around. That means there's lots of midges around. So go ahead and throw those. Um, once you start seeing those betas uh, fly around or just um, being up there quite a bit, I know that right around noon is when I start seeing more and more of the, the betas start hatching. Um, but once I start seeing them, if I didn't know that 
um, noon was going to be the time to start um, throwing the betas. Um, if I started seeing them, that would be my clue to, okay, well, maybe they're not going to be targeting the midges as much and they're going to start going for the betas. And same with caddis. Uh, take the clues that the river gives you, and that really helps you out a lot. Um, and back with the sight fishing aspect of it, um, when you're sitting there uh, walking in the river and you see them if you see them suspended and up closer to the surface they're not taking the the nymphs that are way down deep in the bottom of the the riverbed uh, that are floating by they're up in the middle of the water column and they're probably uh, up there because they're taking the emergers the stuff that's closer to the surface of the water um, and those are those are little things that you need to kind of pay attention to and when you're fishing um, also when you're getting fish Think about where you're getting them. Um, if you're fishing through a deep run, um, are you getting them right at the, the top where it drops from kind of shallow water down into deeper water? Are you getting them through the middle section of the water column down deep? Or are you getting them kind of closer to the tail out where that water starts to shallow up once again? Um, a lot of times if you find fish in one of those areas, you're going to find others in there. Um, and being able to pay attention, think about what you're doing and why you're doing it, and then think about the results that you're getting. If you're fishing down, uh, have a deep, heavy rig on, but it's not getting to the middle of the, the, or the deepest part of the river before it's getting hit, you know that they're fishing or feeding up a little bit closer in the shallower stuff as it's dropping down that uh, kind of gradual slope in those pools. Um, and when you find them in areas like that, a lot of times you can walk right up to the next pool and they're going to be feeding fairly similar to how they were down there. Um, so you got to kind of think about what you're doing and what's working and what's not uh, and make changes accordingly. Um, a lot of times when I'm fishing a spot and I'm seeing fish, um, the first thing I'm going to do is adjust my depth, either uh, get myself a little bit higher in the water column or a little bit deeper. Uh, if I'm still not getting them, that's my cue to, okay, well, now it's time to change different flies. Find out what they're going to be wanting to eat and uh, try to feed them. Uh, if you find what they're wanting, just keep on feeding them. Uh, sometimes that's easier said than done, uh, but it uh, it does work out pretty well. So another question. Go ahead. Uh, Garen Dunn's asking, uh, any help on indicator distance to leap fly with different water Um, yeah, uh, and I have, I have a hard time with this one because being up on the water a lot, I use my, my stretch and reach type method and like, okay, I think that's it. And then I adjust my weight accordingly, um, to get down there. Um, when I'm out with clients, I really like using, uh, the thingamabobbers, uh, they're super easy to adjust. They can, the, actually they're the airlock thingamabobbers. Um, they, they work out real well. I like using more of the uh, neutral colors. I like using either clear or white where they kind of blend in on the surface of the water. Um, two and a half times the depth of the water column is kind of a rule of thumb that I've heard people talk about quite a bit. Um, but in how I fish it, um, a lot of times that's not quite the, the way I do it. If I find that I'm not getting down deep enough and I already have my uh, weight a good distance from my indicator, I'm going to just add another weight to it, make sure that I'm down deep. Um, if it's a, uh, I'm going to slide my indicator closer to my weights to make sure that I'm not allowing my flies to get down as much. Um, if I have a big split shut on, take it off, put a tiny one on. So that way it's uh, not going to sink nearly as fast. Um, yeah, my kind of my rule of thumb with the, the indicator depth, um, I feel like I'm not much help on it just because I have my kind of my own setups and my own way of doing it. But, um, what I always tell people and how I do it is if I'm trying to get down deep, if I'm not, uh, snagging up bottom every now and then I'm going to add more weight till at least I'm ticking bottom about every six casts. Um, and, but if, again, if, uh, the river dictates that, uh, 
the fish are higher in the water column, then I'm going to just take more weight off and fish a shallower rig, uh, slide my indicator down a little bit. So uh, I hope that helps out a little bit, but uh, uh, another question. I'm going to do a little follow-up on that. So you say every sixth cast you're hitting bottom. Are you saying you're hitting bottom in the beginning or middle of the drift or throughout the entire drift every sixth cast you are expecting to uh, no, it's going to be more or less in the uh, after it's got a drift. Because a lot of times, if I'm fishing a deeper run where it's shallow at the top, uh, I almost expect it to hit in that shallower water. But I want it to get down to the deeper part of the run. And if I'm uh, not hitting in the deeper part of the run, then I don't have enough weight on. Um, what I'll do in instances like that, where if I have enough weight on, where each time I'm casting upstream, and it's hitting the bottom quick before it gets to the deeper part, I'm going to move myself uh, downstream a little bit. So that way I'm not casting quite as far upstream into the shallow. I'm going to start it a little bit deeper. Um, but uh, a good question on that. I, I wanted to hit bottom, but there's definitely times where I notice it's hitting bottom during the shallower part of the drift first um, before it gets down deeper. And in parts like that, I'll just kind of uh, adjust where I'm casting to. I might not cast as far upstream, or I might back myself up downstream a little bit, so I'm not hitting that. Uh, same thing goes with the, at the tail out. If I'm finding fish at the tail out, but I'm dragging the bottom in the deeper part, or not dragging in the deeper part, but it starts ticking the bottom as it's coming up and getting shallower, uh, then I'm going to adjust my depth if that's where I'm finding the fish. Uh, I'll take a little bit off so it's not getting down quite as deep. It'll sink through that deep part, but then when it gets into the shallower point of the water, it's not sitting there and dragging as it starts uh, getting shallower and shallower. So, um, Let's see here. Uh, a lot of what I've been talking about is managing the, the depth and the fly selection. Um, but now I'm going to just real quick kind of touch on dry fly fishing because a lot of fishing that we do up at Deckers is nymphing. But uh, throughout the year, uh, you're going to have opportunities to dry fly fish. Um, a lot of it during the winter months is going to be midges. Um, and that's my time of year where I love throwing the little Griffiths gnats. Um, they work good up there. Put on something a little bit bigger above it that probably is not hatching at the time because a lot of times I'll throw a caddis first uh, or a parachute atoms or something that I can see because just throwing a single Griffiths gnat, uh, it's a little difficult to see that. So I like having a little bit larger fly just so if I'm not seeing my little fly back behind it, I can still use that as kind of a, a gauge to where my flies should be for when I'm seeing risers. Um, but this time of year, we've been having some great blue and olive patches up on the water. Um, and just around the corner, like I was saying, the caddis are going to start popping up there. Um, then you get into the first part of July, you start finding more of the uh, PMDs or the pale morning duns. Um, then August through September into October, you get the trico hatches. Um, there's every now and then the river up there throws you for a little bit of a curve uh, where you find something a little bit unexpected. Uh, there's stoneflies that'll hatch up there from time to time where you'll see them flying around the surface of the water. Uh, a few years ago, uh, and I'd never seen them before and hadn't seen them since, but there was actually green drakes popping along the water. I had to ask a uh, local uh, respected fly fishing if I was just seeing things or trying to my head and he's like nope those are those were drakes not sure where they came from but they're they were there and um, a few years ago we had a great Miller moth hatch um, where I'd end up taking a, a chubby and I would cut the legs off it and fluff up that uh, that back antron wing and I would make real long casts and just let it float down the banks and uh, that was a lot of fun because it's always great when they're eating hoppers or miller moths or something big of substantial size where you can track it for a long way. Because then you can put those big hero casts out there, put it over on the opposite bank and just sit there and kind of manage your drift and, and watch it go down. Um, so those are a lot of fun. Um, again, to the dry flies, 
uh, during the summer months, we get lots of hoppers up there. So even when I'm fishing the uh, some of the early caddis um, into the pale morning duns and the trichos, a lot of times I'm doing a hopper with a like a trico dropper. Um, again, that's gives me something to an extra fly out there that they're going to look up and hopefully come and eat. But they're also going to help when you can't find that size 22 trico on the water with all those naturals. Those uh, those hoppers will really help you um, kind of see where your fly is or should be when you're floating it out there. Um, even this time of year, throwing some of the betas on uh, cloudy days where I have a hard time finding my betas on the water, I'll put a hopper on uh, or a caddis, but something a little bit bigger just so I can help me see it. Um, sometimes I'll see a, a fish come up and sip something right over by my caddis and I'll set and it'll will eat a natural fly rather than mine put it right back out there and other times they'll come up and and actually take it where you'll see your your lead fly go down uh, then set that hook and and uh, fish on uh, so it makes it kind of fun but um, I usually when I go up to the plat um, I don't get up there set up with the dry fly and just try to only get fish to eat drives um, I'm up there to catch fish and put clients on fish, so I'm going to work my nymphs, and as soon as I start seeing signs that the fish are looking up and feeding actively on the surface, that's when I'm going to switch over and start throwing my dries. Um, I love throwing dries. I wish I could throw dry flies all day long, but um, it's just not a super effective way to, to put uh, fish in the net up on the, the plat. There's certain times of the days where dry flies are going to work way better than the nymphs, um, and those are the periods that I'm going to focus my dry fly fishing on. Uh, the rest of the time, once the hatch is over, I'm going to go back to throwing my nymphs and looking at my uh, bobber out on the water and put some in the net that way. So, uh, again, one thing that I enjoy and always uh, makes me have a fun day up there is, again, going back to the sight fishing where... Um, like I said earlier, I wish I could throw dry flies all the time, but I can't. And I think, uh, the sight fishing is, uh, the next best thing to it. So, um, let's see. Um, now I'm going to talk a little bit, uh, more about, um, some of the hatches that are going on right now. Some of the flies I like to be using, um, different things like that. Uh, so currently, um, Midge is in the morning, Betis in the afternoon. Uh, I've been noticing that the Betis hatch has been starting a little bit right about noon and then just kind of getting better as the day goes on. Um, those midges are flying around quite a bit in the morning. and You get up there and they're still kind of some of the tiny midges, but you'll also notice some of the, the bigger midges, um, more like size 18s, some even 16s where you can throw, uh, like I, for the larger ones, when I'm seeing them around, I like throwing just a, a zebra midge. Um, it's the one with the tungsten bead, which helps me just get those flies down a little bit. But for the small ones, uh, I mentioned the medallion and the top secret and the uh, black beauty. All of those work out real well. Um, a lot of times what I'll be doing, if I'm finding that I'm not getting uh, fish that I want, change size and color. Uh, sometimes I'll have to go smaller, sometimes I'll have to go red, sometimes I'll have to go a little bit bigger. Um, but just kind of play around and uh, don't be afraid to cut your rig down, restart with some other stuff on there. Um, if you're going, especially in early spring, if you're having to go with some of those real tiny, tiny uh, flies and the flows have come up a little bit, go back to that 6X instead of 6X. Um, it'll, it'll help out uh, in stuff like that. Um, the fish up there, as I mentioned, they are sometimes leader shy and they are sometimes picky. So you just got to kind of give them what they want and really work at getting that nice natural drift down there. Um, talking about fly selection and the weights and getting down, um, again, one of the most important things up there is that good natural presentation. Um, work at a, getting that drag-free drift down through the water. The more natural it appears coming down the water, uh, the more chance you are going to find a fish. If it's getting kind of pulled through the water um, or swung down through there kind of fast, um, a lot of times you won't find fish on that. 
Um, that being said, at the end of my drift, I love kind of letting it swing and letting those fly, especially when I'm nymphing. Uh, when my flies are deep and it's at the end of the drift and they start floating back up towards the surface, um, a lot of times we'll get them on, on what we call on the swing, where those are coming up towards the surface and fish think that they're an emerging uh, insect and they'll come over and, and grab them. Um, but really work at mending the line. Uh, a lot of times, one thing that I find with a lot of people that are up on the river um, who have fished kind of all over the place, um, they a lot of times people find it necessary or want to make those super long casts. And you don't necessarily need them. Uh, I'd rather, with my clients, whether it's a beginner or a, a seasoned angler, a lot of times I'm going to have them shorten their drift and their cast and uh, work water right in front of us. Um, the longer that cast, the more opportunity you have for those kind of crazy little micro drifts that uh, will swing those flies out of position and uh, can screw up the drift. There's times where they're absolutely necessary, where if you're trying to get one over on the far bank, you've got to put a far cast over there. Um, but then you just got to work at really stacking the line, making sure that um, your flies are going the same speed as the water out there. Um, those little adjustments and that mending of the line is, is huge for success out there. Um, but a lot of times those casts, those super long ones, aren't necessary. Uh, go ahead, another question. Uh, this is a personal question. Um, do you prefer, especially with these smaller blue wings and midges, uh, when you're fishing dry flies, do you like um, casting at them from the, an upstream position, and maybe casting across and throwing a reach bend? Or do you like uh, setting yourself up below them and trying to uh, cast upstream? Uh, great question, but a lot of that is all situational. Um, I, I mean, ideally I would love to just be able to cast upstream all the time and have a great man come down and the fish eat it. But, um, depends upon where the fish are feeding and what you're crossing or what you're casting across really makes it depend upon how you try to target those fish. Um, let's say they're on a seam towards the opposite bank. And, but you have some slow dead water in between you and the fish. Uh, a lot of times I'll do a straight across with a little bit of a, a downstream mend just so it kind of swings through there where what I try to do is just get the best drift I can in the fishiest water I can. And situationally it, it kind of dictates how you do it. But there's not a one application is going to work best for everything. Um, you, just like you mentioned, uh, kind of the downstream, the straight across, or the upstream with a big mend in it, uh, whatever one of those is going to give you the best drift and keep your flies in productive water the longest is what's going to work. Um, there's many times where I'm out there where I'm hoping to get about a five-second drift through a certain pocket before it starts swinging. Um, and in those times, I'll try to get my cast on there and sometimes hopefully be able to make it to six seconds before it starts getting either drug under or pulled. Um, but a lot of times if you're casting to rising fish and you have it right over in that area, um, sometimes you don't need that full five seconds. You get it on the water, let it float a little bit, and if one sees it, they'll come up and get it. Um, but again, it's it's all situational. Just like your your mending and where you're fishing and your weight is. Um, however, the river dictates trying to get your best drift in that instance is what I would recommend doing. Um, and sometimes if you come across a pot of fish and they're rising and you're finding that you're not getting of the drift that you want to be successful, then maybe you need to either move downstream or upstream and change your tactics, uh, get a little bit better drift at it, and just kind of find what's going to work for you. So, um, and with that, I'm going to talk a little bit about the bugs. So, as I've been saying a lot right now, um, betas are hatching, um, but we're just about the time to come into caddis. Should be seeing some stone flies. Um, as I mentioned right now, eggs are still something that I. Um, uh, using that are still being productive. Um, 
but I know that stoneflies are productive right now as well. And sometimes if one's working better than the other, I'll switch up. A lot of times on guide trips, one thing that is uh, is great, where I'll have a two-person trip, I'll set up with one of each. And then I have a little bit more time with different rigs on the water. And I can kind of fine tune it like, okay, well, they're really not eating the eggs very well right now, but they're really going after that stonefly. So let's put that stonefly on. Or um, maybe they're not taking either of the lead flies, but one has a little red pyramid on it. The other one has a little top secret and the top secret's the best producer. I'm going to switch out my other rod, get rid of the red fly and go over to a, um, a top secret midge. Um, and that's one of the, the benefits or things that I like about having uh, with two people is I can really kind of fine tune it a little bit quicker rather than switching up rigs every little bit to, to find what's going to be working best. Um, so uh, that, uh, that kind of works there. Um, going back to flies again, kind of hopping all over the place right now. But um, I mentioned earlier caddis are going to be starting to come off. Um, and I do very well on uh, different caddis nymphs up there. Um, some of the green little caddis larva type things. Um, the holy grail is a great little caddis emerger that I like fishing up there. Uh, hare's ears work great as a little caddis nymph um, at times. Um, and there's there's a bunch that are out there that, that work. Um, Again, a lot of the, the flies that I use are ones that I tie and um, I go into the shop and every now and then I, I will look through all the different flies that are out there and there's some great tires out there that are coming up with some really creative stuff. Um, but I, uh, uh, I haven't fished all of them yet, so I'm not always the best at uh, fly selection on flies through the shop. Um, but um, but I always tell people, uh, you want good, up-to-date information on flies to use, ask the guys at the shop because they're, they're either out there fishing every day or talking to people who have just been out, and uh, they get a lot of, lot of unsolicited reports all the time uh, from different anglers. So uh, uh, let's see. Uh, another thing I was mentioning is in, uh, I guess it's usually late June, first part of July, uh, the pale morning dunce and it's usually only a few week window but it is a great time to be up there throwing uh, the PMD nymphs and PMD, PMD dry flies. They're a little bit larger where uh, right now the blue wing olives are uh, size 18s and 20s. Uh, most of the time when I'm throwing the PMDs I'm throwing 16s and 14s and um, a little bit easier to see on the water and when they're out there, it's almost like a switch has been thrown where those fish really just start keying in on uh, those those specific flies. Um, after that, probably our next major hatch and the one that probably lasts the longest through the summer months is the trichos. Um, and uh, the trico hatch is usually 10 to noon, uh, almost every day once they start showing up. Um, a lot of times they'll go all the way into uh, October. Um, I actually was in the Cheeseman Canyon last uh, November with Yvonne, and we had a little window of a, a trico hatch while we were there all the way in November. Um, so they're a pretty consistent hatch. Um, they're tiny little flies. Uh, mostly what I'll be using are size 22. Um, I'm really big fan of uh, Mare's uh, trico. Uh, it's a great pattern for fishing up there. Um, but uh, a lot of those small trico patterns, as long as that uh, white wings that you can actually see on the water, um, they work out. They work out well, and it's usually a short window. And if you get into a, uh, a area on the river uh, where they're hatching, it's a lot of fun. Um, that being said, you can be up on the plat and a great hatch with flies, kind of trichos hatching all over the place, uh, or bathes or uh, pale morning duns. Um, but a lot of times they will only rise in specific areas. It's not like every fish in the river is looking up. Uh, I found a lot of times I'll be 
work in an area and I'll see a ton of flies, but I won't see any surface activity. Where I'll go downstream around a corner and there's a, a nice little flat area that has fish rising all over the place. So it, uh, it's, again, kind of dependent upon where you are on the river. Um, even if you're seeing a ton of flies hatch um, and you see them all over the place, if I'm not seeing fish looking up for those flies that are on the surface, I'm going to either uh, keep with what I'm doing at the time, if I'm being successful with it anyhow, uh, as far as nymphing, or I'm going to move to a spot where I actually have some risers. Um, and it's, a, it's one of the benefits of moving around the river, where stay in one spot, you might be in a thick hatch, but you might not see any fish looking up in that specific area. Where if you walk upstream or downstream a quarter mile, you might find yourself in a dry fly heaven, um, where there's fish all over the river rising. So always, always good to move around and check stuff out. Um, let's see. Um, let's see. I'm going to go. Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about runoff. Um, so as I said, right now we're at, uh, I think I said 270, uh, 270 CFS right now. Great flow for this time of year, but uh, the South Platte drainage had, uh, I think we were just a little bit, at least in March, we were a little bit over 100% of our annual snowpack for the South Platte drainage. Um, so I would expect flows to bump up. Uh, usually during most of the summer, our historical flows are right in that 400 range. Um, there's some years where they end up getting a lot of water, where last year we were fishing the plat at eight or 900 CFS quite a bit. Um, some years where we don't get as much of a flow, that 250 might be kind of a, a higher flow or a, a flow throughout the summer. Um, but with runoff coming, um, and I think this year we our flows will continue to, to increase um, throughout the summer. Um, that's just going to mean that you need to lengthen your rig a little bit and sometimes uh, add more weight. Because again, you want to make sure you're getting down. But as those flows come up, uh, you're going to be having a lot of food in the water. And a lot of times during that time of year, back to my lead flies, leeches and worms. Uh, as that water increases and starts kind of uh, ripping downstream and pushing stuff around the bottom of the river, uh, a lot of those worms and different little insects are getting washed off. And uh, I find that a lot of times during the runoff, uh, fish are eager to eat those bigger flies because why eat a little french fry when you can have a Big Mac? And having that uh, worm or leech or stonefly, something a little bit bigger on there, uh, a lot of times fish are going to take that bigger meal uh, rather than try to look around for that tiny little midge that's in the water. There's still days when I'm up there where that's still what they want, even in the higher flows. But I do find a lot of times that I'll have pretty good luck up there uh, throwing some of the bigger stuff. Um, but again, with those higher flows, back to managing your weight and depth. If you're nymphing, you still want to make sure you're getting down to where the fish are. Um, that even includes in the riffles. Uh, a lot of times the riffle areas are going to be moving a little bit faster. And if you have it set for a kind of a shallow little rig where it's not going to uh, get down very quick in there, uh, you're going to be going right over the fish. Um, but at the same time, if you put a ton of weight on there in that fast water, uh, you're going to be getting stuck on bottom. Uh, luckily, on the plat, without having a lot of huge stumps and rocks, uh, most of the time if you do snag up and get caught on the bottom, it's a fairly easy fix where you can uh, move upstream a little bit, pop it off those rocks or whatever. But um, not getting snagged up or hitting bottom every now and then, going to make the adjustment, make sure I am. So um, let's see here. Um, yep, uh, let's go back to, and this is one other thing I'm, uh, that I've talked about a little bit already, but I'm going to just recover, is thinking on the wall and taking clues from the rivers and your surroundings, and then also just thinking on the water. Um, you want to, again, with our depth, we want to be getting down 
Um, but you want to be using the right stuff and being able to look in the water. And I know a lot of people that will use those little sayings where they'll get in the water, kick around on the bottom and see what bugs are coming up. If you're not familiar with the pot and haven't uh, uh, talked to a local shop about what's going on up there, getting the seine can be a, a game changer. Uh, it'll give you a fairly good idea of what bugs are out there, what size they are, uh, what patterns you should be using. Um, the uh, I think there's a little book called uh, the Streamside Guide to or for the Western U.S. or something along those lines. But a lot of times it shows you the bugs that are identified in different patterns that uh, kind of imitate it. Um, and when I first got started, I would have that with me all the time, and it was a great little resource as far as looking at uh, the bugs, being able to identify them, know what they are. Um, nowadays, I know what they are, but I still can't know their scientific or their genus names or anything like that. Um, I call them bugs still and blue wing olives rather than betas a lot of times. Um, I don't get too specific with it, uh, where the book really does. And it is a, it's a great little resource, especially starting out. Um, it can really help you out as far as recognizing insects and then giving you ideas for different patterns to be using during uh, times when those bugs are present. Um, but using a seine is a great way to figure out what's in the water, what's getting washed downstream, and what uh, the fish might be feeding on. Um, and then, uh, again, going back to some of the uh, clues that the river gives you is just while you're walking the bank and when you see fish in there, um, see where they are. Are they down along the bottom, down kind of deep, uh, getting stuff that's going by them? Are they a little bit higher on the water column, eating uh, emergers, or are they right up at the surface, um, eating the, the adults, um, sipping them in the, on the surface, or taking them as emergers as they're coming up? Um, and then about where you're catching them. Um, because a lot of times, like I said earlier, uh, you find them in one spot, uh, you go upstream to another little hole, a lot of times you're going to find them in very similar water. might not be exactly the same, but uh, they still might be sitting in that same basic uh, type area, uh, still feeding on whatever it is they're eating out there. Um, and then, uh, let's see. Um, and then, uh, oh, we got a question. Go ahead. In the spring, um, this was a question I asked earlier, but we held off because I knew this slide was coming. But uh, in the spring, um, say you're not seeing fish, you're not able to sight the fish, or the light's not appropriate to see fish. What water type do you typically start with? Um, do you typically fish a all of the water types to try to pattern stuff or do you sort of focus in on certain things um, at first and then maybe uh, try to figure out the pattern from uh, that point on? Um, that's a good question. Uh, those low light days uh, do make it tricky up there. Um, especially if you have one pair of polarized glasses and they're a little bit darker lens. Um, a lot of times they're not much help at all. Um, I like using, during those low light days, going with a really light colored lens to uh, help myself out a little bit. Um, that, that can make a big difference. Um, when I'm not seeing fish, if there's not fish in the shallows and I uh, don't have good enough light to see down deep, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of focus on some of those deeper runs. If I'm not seeing them in shallow water, if I'm not able to see deep enough down into the water and spot fish, I'm going to assume that they're kind of down a little bit deep, and so I'm going to work on those waters. Uh, it's really tough when that water is off color. Uh, having fished up there for quite a few years, I know where uh, some of the deeper runs are. But if they got a recent rain and that water is uh, kind of chocolate milky, it makes it uh, kind of tough to, to figure out where to fish. Um, one thing that you can do if it's at a safe enough flow is kind of get out there and walk. Uh, I might go from one bank to the other, and if I find that I'm getting a little bit deeper, 
I might back myself up and figure, okay, well, I'm going to run something kind of big and bright right through this hole and see what I find. Luckily, there's not too many days up on the South Platte drainage where uh, the water's so dirty you can't see uh, deep down into it. Uh, there's times where you may only have about 18 inches of visibility, um, but that will be enough uh, where you can see kind of where the depth changes are. Um, but uh, those low light days, they can be tricky because it's really hard to spot and see where fish are. Um, it is one of those things where I will get up there and try to work a little bit deeper and then just kind of play around changing uh, patterns up. Uh, if I don't have a uh, seine to get in there and put in the water to collect bugs, I'm going to reach down and, and usually I go to, I like finding uh, rocks that are kind of in moving water. But I'll pick a few of those up because on the bottom of them generally are going to be some insects. Um, and that will show you uh, a lot of times uh, it'll show you stuff that's out there. Uh, one thing that I've uh, got accustomed to doing, if I have a client that catches a big stick, I take that stick off the line for him and then I look at it. Because a lot of times there's going to be some moss and stuff on it. And I'll just kind of pick through that moss and find uh, what's out there uh, in it. Uh, a lot of times I'll find those betas. I'll find those scuds. I'll find the midges. I'll find caddis, uh, little pupas on there where they're, uh, the case caddis stuck to it. Um, but that helps me, gives me some ideas as far as uh, things to be trying and using as well. Um but I uh, hope that answered that question there, Yvonne. So, good. Um, any other questions out there? Okay. Uh, David Scott is hes the one who asked that question about the water type. He uh, asked if there's any lens experts in the chat, and he wants a new pair of sunglasses specifically for fishing in Colorado. Any tips? Scott, I know... Uh, that might be something that you're particularly interested in this uh, this time of year. Oh yeah, no, uh, I as far as the glasses, Costas uh, uh, and Smith make great fishing glasses, and I really like that amber lens. Um, it on bright days, it uh, doesn't let so much light in where you're needing to squint all the time. Really breaks the glare up off the water. Um, I personally use a polycarbonate lens. Um, glass is going to be superior as far as scratch resistance and helping out, but I find wearing them day in, day out, um, I, I feel the little bit of that extra added weight to it on the bridge of my nose and behind my ears. And so I end up using a polycarbonate, uh, lens, but I use the, the amber ones from the Costas and they are, they're great all around. Uh, all throughout Colorado type lens. Um, the mirrored ones work out good but aren't 100% necessary. Um, they're uh, both of them and the like the Smith's Guide Choice are both excellent glasses to, to get out on the water as far as a fishing specific um, glasses uh, to be out there uh, fishing. So those would be my two recommendations. Any others out there? Okay. Getting a couple, a couple, a couple more rolling in. So let me try to catch up. Um, setting the hook at the end of the drift when your flies are swinging or rising. What are your strategies for setting your hook when you have a t have a take at the end of your drift? from Brandon B. So um, I'm always going to set in the downstream direction. Uh, at the end of the drift, a lot of times it is harder to set those uh, hooks on those fish because if you lift it straight up, a lot of times you're going to be pulling the fish or the hook right out of the fish's mouth. Um, all throughout the day, I'm always going to kind of give that downstream hook set, kind of a low, uh, if I'm casting, if I'm uh, facing the river and it's flowing from uh, my left to my right, 
I often describe it as a, almost like you're throwing a Frisbee. So even at that bottom of the drift, when it's down there and those the flies are kind of swinging up to the surface, if I get a bite, I'm still going to go uh, in that downstream direction towards the side. Uh, if I do a straight up hook set, I run the risk of pulling those flies right out of the fish's mouth. The downstream sets are, again, they're always the hardest just because of where your line is positioned and where you can set to. Um, it is, yeah, the, uh, they're a tough one to, to set on, um, but that downstream I think is going to give you the best chance or best opportunity to hook and then land that fish. Um, see, that's a, I'm glad somebody brought that question up. I think it was Brandon who asked about it, um, but hook sets are real important. And I see people all the time that will either set straight up or set downstream. And again, a lot of times they miss those fish because they're pulling the hooks away from the fish. Um, generally, I tell people only set the same direction the water's moving. Um, and I'll do that uh, all the time, even at the end of the drift, I'll be setting kind of in that downstream direction. So, uh, Another question, Jake Cannon asked, what's your typical strategy for your first fly rig of the day? Do you typically wait to tie on until you were uh, on the water or do you tie on uh, you know, at the truck or at your house? Um, I am, uh, I'm fortunate enough where I have a, a, the rod racks up on the top of the truck and so my rods are generally rigged and ready to go and most of the time they're rigged and ready to go from the previous day. Uh, this time of year, uh, I'm doing a little bit of rigging at home as far as guide trips go. Uh, I like being able to get out of the truck, get waders on and hit the water. Um, when I'm personal fishing, there's a lot of times that uh, I will kind of make an adjustment when I uh, get to the river. Um, I usually prefer uh, rigging up at the truck. Um, if, I, if I haven't rigged them beforehand, I'm going to take the time while I'm at the truck um, to go rig up. Um, I don't want to um, go march up to a hole and then spend 10 minutes in there trying to rig something up when somebody else might be all ready to go and want to jump in and, and fish that hole. Um, I, uh, every now and then I've, I've come across that where I see somebody up in a spot and they're still taking time to rig and um, I'd, rather, uh, I'd rather not be that guy to, to go and camp out in the spot and try to get all my stuff rigged up there. So I'd, I'd rig up at the truck. As far as a, on the South Platte, um, generally what I'm going to start with uh, day in, day out, uh, first thing in the morning is I'm going to start out with a nymph rig. Uh, most of our hatches that we have are going to happen a little bit later in the day. First thing in the morning, you'll see the midges flying around. Um, but a lot of times with those tiny little midges, you're only seeing sporadic rises every now and then. And it's not enough of um, risers to make me think, oh, I got to have my dry fly set up right now. If I see one or fish, one or two fish rise, a lot of times I'm not going to sit there and take the time to uh, switch out a whole nymph rig to put on a dry fly rig uh, to try for one or two sipping fish. When it's a little bit later in the day and there are uh, you'll see more bugs and there's more activity and more surface activity. That's my time when I'm going to be like, okay, well, now they're, uh, they're looking up and eating on the surface. Now I'm going to sit there and, and change it out. Um, a lot of times those random one or two fish um, that are looking up and eating, um, and maybe it's because I, uh, I throw crappy casts at times, but I'll end up put a cast over there and end up spooking and then they go down and then I don't see anything rise. Um, so a lot of times I'll just, I'll have my nymph rig. Um, usually um, have it set up with a two fly rig, get up there, uh, make some changes. Or if I see something up on the river, that's when I'll add my third fly to it. Um, and uh, a lot of times it's a, a game time decision where I'll see something on the water and be like, okay, well, I definitely want to add a different fly. So instead of 
doing a new rig, I'm just going to add my third fly to it. Um, and using that sliding perfection loop um, is an uh, easy way to, to attach droppers. And, and like I was saying, I know some people will have droppers going through the eye of the hook, um, but I generally will do it right on the back bend of the hook. Um, and then just have three flies tied together uh, off my lead fly at the back bend, uh, then off the back bend to my, my final uh, dropper back there. We have a question from Dalton Watkins. It's actually uh, one that I, I know you have some insight into. Uh, tippet rings or barrel swivels, do, you, do they have any place in your rigs? And if so, why? Uh, oh, I'm a new guy on the barrel swivels. So I'm a big fan of those. Um, for years and years and years, I just would tie a, a, a clinch knot and that would be how I attach my uh, tippet to my leader. Um, as kind of sucks to say, but as I have aged, my eyes aren't working as well, and I find tying right onto the tippet ring rather than two pieces of uh, monofilament or fluorocarbon together are a little bit easier. Another thing I really like about the barrel swivels is um, it adds that extra little bit of weight. Um, sometimes all I need is a tiny little barrel swivel. Um, Another thing I like about them, especially if I'm throwing stoneflies or even some of the leeches um, on my nymph rigs, is uh, sometimes they'll sit there and spin and you'll get a kind of a little bit of a tangle. But with those barrel civils, uh, if it does kind of spin or swing in different water, you don't find your line twisting up as much and it works out real well. Um, I know some people that use the tippet rings and I'm, I like the idea of them. I just find it's a little bit easier going with the barrel swivel and add it, and it adds a little bit extra weight to it as well. So it works out good, but big fan of the barrel swivels. We're going to give a last call for questions. Um, certainly appreciate you coming on Scott. Yeah, no problem. Glad to be here talking with everybody. One thing uh, I will mention, we are still running a 15% off guided trip promo, um, obviously with the um, with everything going on, you know, locking in a date isn't necessarily uh, something that a lot of people can do, but uh, we are offering gift cards online, um, where if you buy the gift cards, use the promo code, I'll put the link in the bio, um, you can basically reserve a trip with with say Scott and uh, get out of the water for 15% you know, uh, less than what you normally have to pay so uh, book Scott Scott's great yeah I uh, I like running trips I can't wait to start getting back out on the water um, and uh, it's yeah, hasn't been the easiest of springs, but I'm hoping uh, things will be changing here. Hoping everybody's staying safe and healthy and uh, soon be back up running uh, guide trips again. So uh, can't wait for that to start happening. Hey, you guys have a good day. Thanks, everyone. So see you out on the river. <laughs>